Hey guys, this is uh, again Pep from Winter Games, and I'm here with Ben LeBay. Ben uh, comes from the academia, uh, is uh, now a research director at CXL, has been uh, at CXL for four years managing experimentation programs for mid market to large enterprises. And he is going to talk about qualitative data. Ben, take it away. Thanks, Pep. I'm going to share my uh, screen here. Um, there we go. Uh, thank you, Pep. The first I want to dive in with uh, what I'll call is an agitation slide. Um, and it uh, agitates along this claim of Pep's on why it's all about the customer. So what we're looking at here, the, we've got five different products, uh, Google products, YouTube, Optimize, Gmail, G Suite. And so look what's going on here. If the king of data, Google, is collecting in a systematic way, not within a project, product, but across, if they're collecting feedback and voice of customer data, what does that mean for you, right? You might think that your competition is directly within your vertical, but it's really, you know, that kind of competition is not your biggest threat. Not these days. Uh, it's the organizations and companies that are well funded. Uh, they're listening to their customers and solving their customer problems by collecting um, voice of customer data, collecting feedback. Um, and the way that they're more directly your competitors is that they're creating these friction, frictionless experiences. They're raising the stakes for all of us. Nowadays, experience trumps everything. It trumps price, it trumps quality, and even trumps your product. You are not selling products, you're, expelling, you're selling experiences. So hundred years ago, we used to compete, our, our companies used to compete on features, uh, maybe 50 years ago when with more competition, they competed on price. Now they compete on who they imply you are. We are now selling experiences. And the only way to measure and account for this is to get feedback and to get voice of customer data. Quantitative data is the table stakes. Now is sort of the age of the qualitative and measuring and benchmarking these experiences because that's what we're selling, right? Um, fundamentally, the quanti quantitative data doesn't account or doesn't really measure well human perceptions. And then the, really the only way to do that is through voice of customer data. And that's what this talk is all about. Uh, from data to insights to action, it's how to deal with this data. Um, so how to process all of this open-ended data so we can benchmark it, so we can get insights out of it and we can act on it, right? Uh, so what I wanna talk about a little bit of the approach and the theory and some frameworks and tools around that. Um, I wanna give some tactical frameworks and, and things like that, make it quite actionable. I've got some case studies at the very end of this short lesson. But first I wanna start out a little bit more strategically with my, my one sort of mental model for addressing this subject, for addressing uh, how, to, how, to dealing, how to deal with data generally and also how to make it actionable. And also dealing with the, the problem of what people say and how that not necessarily what, what they mean, right? So my number one mental model is this right here. And knowing the name of something is not the same as knowing something. This is from my man, Richard Feynman. Um, and it's a really strong mental model for creating hypotheses and research and just doing better research and, and also just doing better communication as a human being. This concept is behind a lot of the fundamental models that we use in marketing and, and, and psychology. So system one versus system two, Daniel Kahneman. This model is, is foundational to that. The reptilian brain versus the mammalian brain in terms of how we instinctually feel about something versus how we logically address it or assess it. This mental model underpins that framework. Um, in the last few years, um, the jobs to be done framework for customer research, like why people don't buy a product, they hire it to perform a job. The product is the name of something, the job is the something, right? Um, so this mental model is behind all of these, these kind of core concepts. It also explains that why we suck at communicating and marketing and gathering voice of customer uh, data. So we think the product is what we sell, but it's not, right? Um, it's not the same. Our perception of value is what we're trying to get at here. And it's really a, a leap from the data that we collect, from the names that we're applying to our products to what the perception of value is. And so this leap that we're jumping, uh, this leap that we're making here from the something to the name, is, uh, from the name of something to the something is what I wanna dig into. And I wanna start out with uh, the data or a version of, of data. Because uh, this talk here, this lesson is how to code and how to deal with that qualitative data. 
I want to jump into a form of this data that looks like this. And this is the result of a recent coding exercise we did. Uh, real data from a real client selling jewelry online. Um, this was from a customer survey asking a question to get at recent first time purchaser motivation in this case here. The question, what matters to you most when buying jewelry? This isn't the raw data, it's been coded, right? The raw data is a bunch of open-ended um, um, answers to that question, right? But we coded it. This is thus information. So we now, with these codes, we have the signal strength of the names that people give to what matters to them, right? At this stage, we're still listening to what they say. We need to now try to make that leap over to what they mean and try to get from the name of something to, to the something. So now we need to find patterns. Uh, we need to search and we need to thrash through this. And, and we did a little bit of that in creating these codes, but we need to do that uh, a step further. So more connections between the data. And there are different types of patterns, similarity, correspondence, things like that. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but usually the first stop on the road is dissimilarity. Um, so what we see are related codes around quality and price and style in, the, in this case. Um, and when reevaluating the signal of strength between these categories, these codes within a pattern, we move away from quality, in this case being the biggest factor to actually style and meaning to be the, being the focus. If you add up a lot of this, that data, you, you'd see that. So now we have a better foundation for some hypotheses, maybe some theories uh, for what motivates recent first time purchasers for this e-commerce shop. Meaning, in this case, meaning and material value are the a big core motivating themes. They want the jewelry to connect to something in their lives, right? That's a big thing to, to pivot on, to, to hang our hat on to in terms of a strategy and where we're going um, with how we might apply this data. So what we've done tactically is we've gone from data to information to trying to get at uh, knowledge. Um, and there's a framework for this. It looks a little bit like this. The difference between the names of something and the something has to do with that leap uh, from data to knowledge, from reality to, um, to abstract uh, nature of, of human perception, right? Uh, what people say to what they mean. Um, this model stretches over a lot of cool hypotheses in marketing um, and, and, and you can use it in your personal life as well, a ton as well, communications and things like that. Um, ultimately, what we're doing at the core of this, the heart is that data to code to category. This is the pattern finding uh, and this is where coding qualitative data uh, is both an analysis and a heuristic. So I wanna dig into that a little bit more. Ultimately, coding is about pattern finding, pattern recognition, information processing. A, a code is a, a word or phrase that, that gives sort of this essence capturing or evocative meaning to something. In our case, usually these open-ended survey responses. When we code, we classify to reach for meaning. And there are different ways to do this and, and, and different ways to sort of explore data. And you have to realize that it's iterative and, and, and doing it multiple times over and over, um, you'll get some benefits. And it's important to understand that there's different lenses in which you can, you can take to it. So let's, let's dig even a little bit deeper into these codification lenses. So if you take a particular response, an open-ended response, um, we're sticking with the jewelry thing going on here. Uh, here's an open-ended response out of that uh, survey. I really don't see why this is so expensive. Seems like I can get it elsewhere for less. Um, well, again, different lenses in which you can code this, right? You've got one lens of price because uh, they mentioned it's expensive. Value is there as well. Uh, there's a difference between price and value in the, in the comparison nature. And then competition, you know, they mentioned they could get it somewhere else. That might be the lens in which you, you choose to code this, um, this response. Um, so again, there's, there's different lenses. And then when you, you can sort of have a different goal in mind as you search for pattern and start to thrash around here. And the patterns, by the way, I mentioned the first stop in the road is around similarities and dissimilarities. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways which these codes can relate to each other. Um, it, it's, and again, it's cyclical. Um, and the pattern also is in everything. A lot of times there's gold in the anomalies, what comes out of the pattern. Um, there's schools of thought actually around codification that, that, um, uh, that you actually don't want to do this reductionist kind of activity too, too hardly. You don't, want to, you don't want to have too much of a scientific approach. It's really about the thrashing around 
Um, but what, what, what is here is just some frameworks for you to think a little bit constructively as you do that thrashing. Now I wanna drill in in the few minutes I have left here into some of the, some of the frameworks for actually seeing things coded, right? In, in principle, um, you know, this is kind of the framework for how to do it. You've got a spreadsheet where the responses there are, are the rows. And as you read a response, you, you might start adding these columns, these issue columns. And there's some math with regards to survey science. Um, you know, generally we're shooting for around 250. If it's a gen pop type of uh, product or service, you wanna get a little bit more. If it's a real niche uh, product or service, you can, you can use a little bit less. And that's to get ni a nice confidence interval that the strength of signal of, of, of that you know, issue bucket that you're classifying or that you're quantifying is representative of the population of your customers, right? Uh, there's some links here throughout this deck. Um, I'll mention it at the end, but you can get the hands on the deck to, to get these links and, and get that juicy stuff. Um, and a little bit more full, full fleshed out. This is the actual um, a screenshot of the actual um, Google sheet that we used in the codification process. So you can, again, just a real, more of like a real life version of, of that previous slide there. Some real quick um, tips and tactics. I wanted to, to provide you something um, a little bit more tactical on this. Some question tips. We're, we're collecting codify, you know, th this data. You want to make sure that you're processing data that's um, that's valid. And so I, I like to always uh, remind everybody that we we work with as, as we as we ask the questions and set up the surveys. Avoid why questions, was questions. These trigger rationalizations. Uh, there's a lot of good science on that. You open with the you know how, where, what, when, that kind of thing. Uh, definitely what we're talking about is open-ended. So even if you're providing an NPS score, put an open-ended question at the end. Um, test your open-ended questions by trying to answer with a yes, no question. So in our case, like uh, what matters to you most when buying jewelry? Yes, that doesn't make sense. Okay, good question. Uh, that means you, you, you're making your, your respondent work a little bit. Use closed-ended questions for benchmarking, not for this type of research. Um, real quick, um, some tools that, that I go to um, in my grab bag a lot. Um, Amazon Comprehend is a tool by Amazon that's sort of a DIY natural language processing service, and you can API into it. Uh, a lot of those enterprise level uh, SaaS companies down at the bottom probably do something like that, probably APIing into Amazon Comprehend. Um, Chatter Mill, Luminoso, Monkey Learn, those there. Although Monkey Learn, I, I know is not. Um, uh, a free kind of cool, quick tool doing topic modeling is that SEO Scout link there. Uh, and then a cool tool just to highlight and dig into that I'm really, really loving, um, user leap. They're, they're doing the surveying and uh, coding the data as well. Lastly, um, I'll mention that it's not enough to know, you've got to act. I'm going to rush through a couple case studies on how to apply this in real life with a couple e-commerce uh, sites. This is um, Native Deodorant, Procter & Gamble brand. Um, this is a, a site I worked with for a few years doing um, CRO work. Real expensive deodorant, $12 a stick. Do I hire twelve dollars? You know, deodorant at $12 a stick to stay, to stay fresh and clean? I do not. Uh, we rewrote the value prop deodorant without the chemistry experiment. This is the something. This is why I would hire deodorant at twelve dollars a stick um, to to you know not pollute my body. Another example: Nanit, um, these really fancy baby cameras. Uh, this is a product detail page. It's supposed to have a lot of details. That's not the problem. Um, but the problem is I've landed here after a retargeting Instagram ad after visiting the site only one time. And there's a lot of names of something that do not mean anything to me. Scroll down a little bit. Uh, this is what you see. A lot of shiny, happy people, some cool numbers. This starts to be the something, right? Not the names of something, but the something that I'm after, right? I don't want a $300 camera. I want 92% sleep efficiency for my child. I don't want a $300 camera. I want a 12 minute uh, sleep onset for my child, this is the something, not all those details, not the names that you're giving it as a, as a marketer. So a couple of examples of this kind of principle in action. With that, that's all I got. Um, it's been 15 minutes, I, I believe, Pep, I, I would open it up to some Q&A. Yeah, yo, 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 thank you very much. Uh, question number one, so, 
gathering the qualitative data in and then codifying it, how long does that take? Uh, if you're dealing with, you know, two, 300 responses, you're reading each one. As you read one, you, you add an issue category, you add an issue category, you go to the next, you go to the next. This is under an hour. It's not so crazy. It seems crazy, but it's not. It's, it is some tedious work. Don't outsource it. Don't do it to a junior colleague. For you to make that leap and do the art part, the heuristic part, you have to have it in your gut. You have to read through it and do that work, um, by the way. Yeah, so not a ton of time. It just It's some grunt work, but it pays off to do. Does it uh, depend on the type of company? Is it, does it have to be B2B? Can it be anything? It can be anything. We do this for B2B, Legion, products, services. Um, what your the data points that you're getting in an open-ended way, you can get motivation data via surveys. You can get fear, uncertainty, and doubt data with on-site intercept polls. Open-ended data, the you know, the open oh, field yeah. after an MPS question, like, like, you know, why are you a promoter? Because I love your blah, blah, blah. Like codifying that, whatever open-ended thing, social listening, chat logs, this the same thing applies. Can you use that data to create personas? You know, like there's a cohort or type group of people that answer this way and that way. Absolutely. So the way that we look at personas is very question oriented. So what questions are you looking to solve? You know, are you looking to see how users differentiate, differentiately engage with your product? User based uh, persona, right? And the questions that you're surveying those users with have to do with, with how they're using it, how they're not using it, things like that. Goal focused personas, buyer personas, visitor personas, those different types, all those different types of personas all answer different types of questions. And so what you're surveying those questions, those users with will differ a little bit, but ultimately you're still after like, um, you know, the motivation data you know, anxiety data, what's the hangups, what are the questions, getting them to walk through their day on what, what they're doing, how they're using a product, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, last question here. You mentioned you're going for like around 250 responses or so on. Uh, so if you don't have that many people taking your survey, can you use like Facebook ads to drive more survey responses? Yeah, different tactics here. So if you've got a list of 10,000, you can expect about a 2% response rate, 2 to 5% response rate, depending on your brand loyalty. Um, you're good, right? But if you have only 2,000 people on your list, you need an incentive, a $5 gift card, a chance to win an iP iPad, a percent off of your product. You can bump up your response rate to 10%, 10% of 2,000, 200. Uh, so you can play with your response rate and what you can expect with incentives or no incentives. And you can also recruit from your website, right? The hot jar, recruit, survey, bam, 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 right there as well. Facebook, you, you can recruit from a lot of different places as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ben. Guys, you can find Ben on LinkedIn, Ben LeBay. He's uh, posting videos and interesting stuff there. So uh, connect with him there, uh, post your follow-up questions. And we're heading over to our next talk. Cheers.